Now, quarter past nine, Julian, so you may begin if you wish to. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get started now. Okay. Right, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. I apologize for the glitches yesterday. I assure you they were all entirely of my own fault. <laughs> um, and I'm really not very dexterous with this technology. But anyway, I, uh, I sincerely hope that today we're not going to have any. So we've seen that when the early Christians in Europe were exploring what kind of Roman building to use for their first churches, they settled on two. The centralized form of the basilica. And having spent some time with the first, I'm now going to go back to the second, the longitudinal, longitudinal type. And I want to show how it was developed early as a journey, as a series of spatial events and rhythms that urge you from the ordinary everyday world deeper and ultimately higher into spiritual realms where you may find God. And we'll begin again with the churches in Ravenna of the sixth century because in spite of the ravages of time, they still show so clearly how everything in their making was harnessed to, to this idea. Right. I hope you've all got a, an image on your screen saying Lecture 3, Journey to Paradise. Then, with no more than a glance at the next 600 years, I'm going to concentrate on the High Gothic period in 12th century France, Sorry. when a really great series of architectural inventions took the Basilica journey to new and extraordinary heights, literally and figuratively. And finally, I'll take another leap in time to the beginning of the 20th century to the work of Antonio Gaudi. Sorry, sorry, the... Julian, we're not seeing no. the right slide. I've only got one slide on the thing. Yeah, I, I think it's the wrong one. It's slide five. Oh, dear me. Thank you. So, uh, sorry, Julian. Julian, yeah. can you can you can you sh you are also not showing a, a full screen? It's not working. Can you stop? Uh, can you click on that uh, exit uh, keyboard key? The E E S C key. Yeah, I can't see it. Can you see it now? Okay. Now. Yeah. Uh, st stop sharing. Uh, stop sharing. Stop sharing. Where do I find stop sharing? I can't see stop sharing anywhere. Go back to the to the share, mm -hmm. to the share content today. Okay, Teams icon. Uh, this one. Okay, now. Um, okay, now I'm back to the I'm back to the primary screen again. I've stopped sharing, so now I must share again, right? You haven't stopped sharing. Uh, did you click on that share content tree to stop sharing? I'll click on here to stop sharing. Okay. 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 Click on it again. Share Don't click on the PowerPoint. Click on screen one, please, on the mm -hmm. desktop. Okay. And then, yes, and then go to, yeah, slideshow. Right. Is that all right now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you for telling me about that. So uh, I'll just carry on from where I was. Right. The longitudinal uh, Basilican Church was the preferred one in the West 
And there were two main variants, which you can see on the screen there. Uh, one was simply an oblong on the left with one or more apses at the end, opposite the entrance. And the other had cross arms shortly before the apse called transepts, thus forming a distinct cross shape known as the Latin cross. And where the long and short arm cross is known as the crossing, uh, and it has significance as the marking point at which you enter the most holy part, uh, that's the choir and sanctuary that would be up at the top of that drawing. We've seen some of the reasons for this longer form's popularity. Functionally, the centralized type had a major disadvantage, being not nearly suited uh, as suited to the Western liturgy as the basilica, which works well, as you could, uh, I'm sure, imagine, for congregations worshipping together and for processions, and it was a cheap and easy form of building. Added to these, for better or for worse, the church being connected into the avenues of power, the basilica suited a hierarchical social order very well, with the bishops and the aristocracy in the most sacred, least accessible part, and then all the way down along the length to the lowest level of society at the back. That's the way of viewing these buildings as elements of power. However, viewed in a more poetic way, the length worked beautifully as a representation and experience of the journey from the everyday to the holy. And the old St. Peter's in Rome, which was started by Constantine in about 320, was a basilican church with four aisles. And you can see clearly in the plan that there's a sequence of eight distinctive spaces from the street to the altar, starting at number one. A flight of stairs, a landing, a gateway, an atrium, the narthex, that's the porch, the nave, the crossing and the apse and the three dimensional up at the top gives you some uh, picture of how that looks spatially. That St. Peter's no longer exists, but there are beautiful early examples of the basilica type in Ravenna, built at roughly the same time as San Vitale that we looked at yesterday. Uh, there are two with the same name. Santa Polinare, one in Classe, which was the old port a few kilometers outside of Ravenna, and the other one, Nuovo, which is in the city. And we're going to start with the first, which is the one on the screen. Externally, as by now we would expect, it's plain and sturdy, built finely of Roman bricks, but a big barn with not too much architectural ambition other than that insistent rhythm of arched windows, which do hint at what is to come. But it's meant to look like something that fits easily with familiar ordinary buildings in the city. The front, you would not have seen like this originally because in front of the church, there was an atrium, as we saw in St. Peter's, of which the porth, uh, porch or narthex at the entrance, which you can see on the picture, is a remnant. The atrium would have been something like this, a quiet preparatory space, uh, and also where a procession going out or coming in could stop for special prayers. Now th you go through the narthex and inside the door where you are transported into another world, with all the same devices of low golden light on silky surfaces, richly veined marbles, and so on that we've seen in the Gala Placidia and also in San Vitale. But here, everything is organized to urge you on an insistent rhythmic journey to a glorious goal. You can feel the surge towards the apse like a wave with every ripple pushing you towards the shore. The vibrant columns march you forward. The arches reinforce the rhythm with a kind of lively bounce. Those medallions above the arches roll you onwards, 
and the windows in the aisles and the clear story and the trusses on the roof all add their beat. So when you start there, you move almost involuntarily towards the end in the, in the goal at the apse. And when you reach the apse, whose curve holds you, the spatial forces become vertical. Below is an eternal green garden, an image of paradise with St. Apollinare there, his hands pointing upwards, standing in the grass among trees, flowers and sheep, i.e. people. And above is a symbolic representation of the transfiguration of Christ. which you will know is where, when Christ went up the mountain and was bathed in divine light. The colors below are green, i.e. connected with the earth, and above they're gold, in other words, precious, and silky like a fabric, not bodily. And then the deep recessive blue uh, in the circle, with this, uh, which is this of sky again with stars. So everything has been used to draw you from your normal existence outside, deep into another reality. Yeah, is that a problem? Are you trying to contact me? There's some noise. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Okay, thank you. Um, so everything's been used to draw you from your normal existence outside deep into another reality and upwards to illumination through the cross of heaven. And above the arch in the gable are the same images of the four evangelists telling the way, just as they did in that little cliffside cave in the Tigray in Ethiopia that we looked at on the first, first day. That church gives a, a clear picture of the intention of the simple architectural idea, but much of its decoration has been lost and changed. So we're going to look at this other Santa Polinare now, Nuovo, in the city, which in the nave shows much better the wonderful way that art was integrated into the idea uh, to make it a profoundly sacred journey. So there are these um, sequences of mosaics along the walls and they are just above the arches. And on one side, the, uh, the, the, in fact on both sides, there are images of places that you might set out from. On this side, it's from the port of Classe. And from there, Processions of virgins move gracefully down an avenue of palms towards the apse. Look how the rhythm of their clothing, halos, plants, gestures, feet, all amplify that of the columns and windows. And just before the apse, they join the three kings. And look how their bodies lean forward. They reach forward with their gifts increasing the sense of expectation. And now in the choir, the still angels on each side of the Virgin and Child. The sequence echoed on the other side. It starts with the King's Palace, followed by a procession now of martyrs in white tunics, whose halos and crowns and feet reinforce the rhythm of movement. Even the letters on their tunics add a syncopated beat. And they move towards the still figure of Christ, also seated amongst four angels. So in this church, the apse has been poorly altered, as in the other one, it was the nave. And we, one must visualize this one as being the, the apse of this one being similar to the one in the Santa Polinare in class A. I hope you agree it's the most wonderful synthesis of, of the mosaics and their content with the architectural elements in constructing a journey forward to another reality. 
And it's, it's an insistent, but it's not a regimented journey. And like the columns in this photo, I'm sure you will have seen that each virgin or martyr or angel is different from the next. Element with a vertical dimension in these early Christian places, one must mention is the tower or campanile. It was in fact in Ravenna that towers were first used in churches to carry the bells, to mark the sacred place in the landscape and to make a connection between earth and sky. And note how right at the beginning, the designers worked to make the connection graceful. So there's a slight batter on the walls. In other words, they slope inwards and the structure is lighter towards the top, thus increasing the sense of stability, of weight at the bottom, and also of height with lightness at the top. Now, over the next 600 years, this basilican form of sacred space underwent many changes and appeared in countless variations in different parts of Europe. And we certainly don't have time to look at this huge area of architectural history. However, a glimpse will show that the three metaphors we've been exploring do indeed penetrate through the so-called Carolingian and Romanesque periods of architecture. The idea of the layered journey from earthly existence to divine vision. And this 12th century uh, Sant'Ambrogio in Milan is a good example of that, with its fine atrium, almost as long as the church, and both together making a journey of about 130 meters. So it's a very long walk from where you enter to where you finally come to the altar. Secondly, the effort to create a, a greater sense of height and upliftment, as here in the austere but moving saint Philibert Tourneau, which is in France, while retaining the atmosphere of mysteriously lit, dark, cave-like spaces. And then there was this sudden breakthrough, which occurred in France in the middle of the 12th century. It meant that within a hundred years, it was possible to conceive of and build something of the delicacy of La Saint Chapelle, all out of stone. <laughs> Doesn't it make you feel faint at the wonder of it? Mm. The breakthrough. The breakthrough was made by an individual who wasn't an architect at all, but, uh, but who had a brilliant conceptual mind and used the skilled craftsmen of his time to act out his ideas. He was this person, the Abbe Suger of Saint-Denis, which is an abbey on the outskirts of present Paris, which at the time was the royal center of the church and the place where kings were buried. But he was more than an ab abbot. He was also an advisor and friend to two kings of France, and he acted as a regent when one of them was away on the Second Crusade. So he was a person of considerable power, and he was also very focused and organized. When he arrived at Saint-Denis, the abbey was in a mess. Its affairs were in disorder and its buildings in very poor condition. So he quickly moved to sort it out. And when it came to fixing up the buildings, he wasn't interested in a palliative restoration. He wanted to transform them into something entirely new, which would meet his theological idea of what an important place of worship should be. That idea was derived from the works written in the sixth century by the uh, Neoplatonic theologian called Dionysus, the pseudo Areopagite, who, which is the one in the middle. Now this Dionysus had become confused with a first century Greek saint, Saint Dionysus, the Areopagite, who was converted by St. Paul, and also with Saint Denis, who was a Frenchman who was martyred by beheading in the third century. And you can see that the story is that he picked up his head and carried it for a while after having been beheaded. 
Now, I'm not sure what San, uh, what Sujia actually believed, but he put out that he was fixing up the cathedral according to the theology of Saint Denis himself, who was the saint to whom the abbey was dedicated and also the patron saint of France. But whatever the unpromising inconsistencies there are in these confused identities, it was the writings of the pseudo Areopagite who gave which gave him great justification for what he wanted to do. And they gave him three basic ideas. That the universe was made and given life to by the one, the Lord, the light that exists beyond all ordinary light. Secondly, that there's a huge difference between the highest form of existence at the level of idea and the lowest at the level of the purely material. However, it's possible to link them because God is in everything. So everything has something of God's light. And thirdly, that you can, by recognizing the light in ordinary things, in a sense, climb a ladder up to the light of God. So the radiance in a, uh, in a work of art or architecture, the beauty of a material or the way that it is shaped and its unity help you detect its particular deep truth and hence to experience the deeper imperceptible truths, the transcendent harmony and the radiance which is God. That was the pseudo uh, Areopagite's ideas. So when Sujio set about his transformation, his aim was to take the old building out of the darkness into the light. He wanted everything in it to be made of such beautiful materials and such perfect craftsmanship that you would have this ladder of light to God. And as you moved into it, all the elements would work together to draw you up into its transcendence. An American art historian, Vincent Scully, said of the Gothic that it came out of the desire to create a blaze of light that would dematerialize the mass of the building the volume of its structure into a mirage of heaven on earth. But I think Sujia's idea was rather that it would enable an experience of heaven on earth. When Sujia got started, he was very excited by the freedom offered by the pointed arch and the ribbed vault. And this perhaps requires some explanation. There were two huge advantages of the pointed arch over the round semicircular one. Firstly, it distributed the load it was carrying more vertically, i.e. it didn't exert quite the same outward thrust as the round ones. So the supports could be smaller and with less buttressing. Secondly, the pointed arch, with the pointed arch, you were not forced to have square bays. You could work with a short and a long side together, as in fact it does in this drawing. You simply flattened or steepened the arch so that their apexes would meet at the same point. And I hope you can read that on the drawing. And then thirdly, the use of ribs in the vaulting had two ad advantages. You could start building with the ribs as the structure, and the vault could simply be a light infill between them which made a very light structure. Also, the ribs could be twisted so that you could make a vaulted space of almost any shape. Here you can see how light you could make it with very delicate ribs carrying the structure and enabling the walls to be very thin or all window. So each bay became a kind of little light trap perfect for Sujia uh, seeking the light. There are examples in Saint-Denis of how easily bays which are not square work. These are the very irregular vaults Sujia built running around the curved apse of Saint-Denis. All this, he was assisted hugely also by the flying buttress which enabled the whole structure to be carried on a skeleton, again with the spaces between filled in either lightly or with glass. 
So with this new capacity, he began reconstruction. And this is the west en entrance end of Saint-Denis when he started. The missing spire became unstable in 1840, apparently, and was taken down to avoid a catastrophe. Now, it's interesting that the cathedral front is based on the model of the Roman triumphal arch. So he symbolizes in the main entry the return of the triumphant god, but also of a general or king. Suger was a royalist, and he believed in the divine right of kings and placed the king's chapel directly over the narthex, the entrance porch, behind the rose window, uh, the round one over the main door. And this photo shows how it was illuminated by the great rose window. And it was, in fact, the first use of such an element. The circular form represented the immutable geometry of the universe, and that reflected God's oneness and power. So the king was associated with that power. The making now of every part, small and large, had to be perfect to bring out its inner truth, through which he would be inspired with God's light. He never got to rebuild the nave in his lifetime, but eventually, long after he was dead, the whole cathedral was changed to meet what he had envisaged. So after entering a comparatively low narthex, he would emerge into and along this nave with every beautifully crafted element gleaming, as it were, with God's light. Just look how every element of the construction, while their rhythm urges you forwards, their lines draw your eyes vertically upwards towards the soaring vaults. What Suger did get to build was the climax of the experience a whole new chevet, this cluster of chapels around the apse. He did it with the most delicate columns, all shining in what was called a crown of divine light. Now, this work really revolutionized sacred Christian architecture, and Suger's ideas and the new qualities he achieved seemed to strike a chord. So in an extraordinarily short space of time, there were at least a dozen new cathedrals in about 100 kilometers of, of Paris. And here are two of them, Notre Dame in Paris and Notre Dame in Chartres, with their characteristic profiles, twin towers in the west, the tall nave, the flying buttresses with their spiky pinnacles over the aisles radiating around the chevet. Two versions of West Ends with their twin towers, great portals for entries, and rose windows. Two sets of main entrance doors with their beautiful carvings already giving clues of the soaring verticality that is to come. And also in Suger's terms, through their beauty revealing the light of God. Two sets of flying buttresses revealing the stable framework of the structure. Soaring naves with all their lines urging your eyes upwards and rhythms urging you forward. This from the lower aisles into the higher nave, giving a sense of the upward movement of space. And two choirs with a chevet around the ends, illuminated with the glorious lights of heaven. Now, probably the chief chord that this architecture struck was the widespread theological debate just at that time in that place around scholasticism. And the great art historian Erwin Panofsky in his long essay, Gothic Architecture and Scholasticism, reckons this was one of those rare times in history that the idea of zeitgeist, the spirit of the age, actually worked in a surprisingly precise correlation of a developing theological discussion and art and architecture. The correlation arose, he says, because the teaching of scholasticism was normal in schools and the arguments that it was examining were so widespread that the master builders of the time would certainly have known about them. 
if not directly from their school education, then from sermons and public debates. Thus, their method in building followed closely on the core idea of scholasticism, which was to establish the unity of truth by reconciling faith and reason. Establish the unity of truth by reconciling faith and reason. In a sense, we've seen the faith side of the equation. So now for the reason. The scholastics accepted that rational argument could not give definite proof of the existence of God or of other aspects of Christian belief, such as virgin birth, the miracles and the resurrection. However, they showed that it could be used to clarify these articles of faith, faith and also to show that it's impossible to disprove them. And furthermore, rational thinking could also demonstrate the similarities between these mysteries and what we know from experience. For example, between a conception of God's creation and the creation of an artist. So the idea of clarification or manifestation is a core scholastic idea. And to make something manifest in the most rigorous way, they said, you need to ensure that the process of your reasoning, your method is absolutely clear. And you would do this by unpacking your method in a series of homologous parts by demonstrating the distinctness of each part and showing how they all fit together. Now the spatial equivalent of manifestation as shown in these Gothic cathedrals was transparency. Not that you could literally see right through the uh, cathedral, but transparency about the way that it was constructed. Sorry, I should have gone past that one. So you can see here in the exterior of Bourges Cathedral, everything is evident. You can see distinctly the various parts, the nave, two levels of aisles, the towers, the apse with its appended side chapels. You can see exactly how it's constructed because in the flying buttresses, the whole skeleton is manifest. And in its horizontal divisions, you can get a good idea of how it was built up in a series of layers. So the second requirement of, a mani of, of manifestation in a thesis or a building was that it should have a unified hierarchical arrangements of all its parts so that you can see or experience the role that each part plays in the buildup of the whole. The toe bone connected to the foot bone connected to the foot bone and so on. Thus the cathedral would be clearly subdivided into major parts, the narthex, nave, transepts, choir, chevet, into major and minor vaulted spatial units, subdivided into major and minor column types, subdivided into colonnettes, subdivided into mouldings. And the windows with their tra traceries subdividing further and further and further in a hierarchy of transoms and mullions. And in this, what they call fractionalization, each level of element must be distinct. In Bush Cathedral, you can see how that works. Firstly, the spatial components. So here is the nave and the primary aisle. Here is the secondary aisle. Each one is distinctive. And here you can see the whole hierarchy, which is both a satisfaction of structure and also a build up from earth to heaven. In these two photos, look at how the arched structural components break down from the larger to the smallest pieces, with each level distinct and in a perfectly logical, even, almost mechanical way. And here you can see that even a component like a column is broken down into smaller components. If you look at the one on the right, vertically into the base, the shaft and the capital, horizontally into a series of colonnettes wrapping around. 
And you can also see how the ribs of the vaults are broken down into mouldings. If you go outside the building, such as the West End, you can see a similar clear construction from the smaller to the larger components in the integrated system of architectural and sculptural elements and in the tracery in the windows. There's something further that results from this thinking, and that is human scale. Because you can relate your individual size and being to the building, and you do that because you can measure yourself against it. It has a ladder of sizes, which visually you can climb up from the smallest details, which are not much bigger than your fingers, to the vaults 30 meters above you, and hence to the space as a whole. We can conclude that these marvelous buildings do what they were aimed to do. On the one hand, to enable a powerful, uplifting spiritual experience, which could give you a sense of what Dionysus called super essential light. And on the other, to frame it within absolute structural and visual logic. Faith and reason are reconciled. Now, looking back in time from the present, it seems curious that for centuries, the Gothic sacred places were viewed somewhat disparagingly. As a style, it never became rooted in the Mediterranean in the way that it did in the north. And the term Gothic has in its etymology a negative racist idea of the Goths as barbarous, uncivilized Teutons. Even in my architectural training 60 years ago, it received nothing like the attention that the classical system did. It was so viewed some, somehow as it, as, it, as it was used in romantic novels of the 19th century as a mysterious, melancholy, even ghostly remnant of antiquity. For those who've read Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey, you'll remember that the young Catherine was so excited when she was invited to the Abbey and envisaged its long, dark passages, its narrow cells and ruined chapel within her daily reach, and she could hardly subdue the hope of some awful memories of an ill-fated nun. And then, with many of the aristocracy, who didn't have ruins of an abbey in their country estates, they would actually build some to help evoke those alluring associations. The prejudice against it when I trained was such that when I toured Europe as a student, we focused on all the classical buildings of France and Italy and felt a little guilty when we actually enjoyed visiting the Gothic ones more. They seemed to have more heart. We weren't even taught by our functionalist teachers about Gothic structure. What an incredible triumph of human ingenuity were those structural ideas I've mentioned already of pointed arches, ribs, and flying buttresses. And if you look at the drawing on the right of them constructing those ribs from wooden scaffolding 15 stories above the floor, and I can assure you they were using very inadequate cement, they certainly were miraculous. The modernists found the Gothic too decorative, too th uh, frilly, too spatially romantic, too antiquated to have any relevance for the present. And because of that, we weren't introduced to a person called Violet Le Duc, who was a well-respected 19th century teacher of architecture in France and restorer of old buildings. In fact, he restored Notre Dame in Paris. He saw what you can see in this drawing, the amazing structural logic of the buildings. He knew the Gothic system intimately and analyzed every part of it. And he showed how even those pieces, such as the pinnacles on the top of flying buttresses, are motivated by structural rationale. Everything admirable in the Gothic, he said, its integrity, its coherence, its lightness and elegance, derives from this structural rationale. And now he said that we are no longer building in stone, but in cast iron and wrought iron. Architects should be seeking new architectural forms as appropriate to those new materials 
as Gothic was to stone. And he produced drawings to demonstrate what he meant. They showed a much lighter structure that was possible with, with, uh, than was possible in brick and stone. The use of diagonal columns to take up diagonal stresses and of decoration based on the tensile capacities in wrought iron it had a huge impact his work on Art Nouveau. And his way of thinking and the images he produced were known to many architects around the turn of the 20th century, including the Catalan architect Antonio Gaudí. So the somewhat surprising reality that comes out of this is that in his buildings, many of the forms which appear to be strange and idiosyncratic, such as leaning angled columns and organically shaped curvilinear roofs, are actually extremely efficient structural solutions, or at least rooted in rational structural thinking. His design of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, in many ways, is a latter-day Gothic cathedral. Actually, his model was the German cathedral in Cologne on the left. Gaudí began work on his in 1883, and as I'm sure many of you would know, it's still not quite finished, even with all the computer carving that they're doing nowadays. So you can see how amazing it was that they built those French cathedrals in, you know, between 50 and 100 years, some of them. You can see that the plan is in principle Gothic, with its flight of stairs at the bottom of the, of the picture, leading up to the narthex and the west end, inside to a nave with two aisles on each side, the transepts making a Latin cross, the choir and chevet of apples, <laughs> of chapels at the top. It would be difficult to make an argument that in all respects it meets scholastic requirements of fractionalization. However, there's no doubt that the smallest detail is designed within the same language of forms as the largest, and that the structure of the building is made manifest and has much of the transparency of its forebears in France. The spiritual intentions too seem to echo those of the Abbe Suger, to use materials with such reverence that they reveal the divine, to make a place of worship through soaring spaces which inspire an experience of God's light and embody paradise on earth. in a little piece of metalwork which beautifully captures the malleable tensile properties of wrought iron, which I suppose Suger would say show something of God's light. It's demonstrated again in a, a, a gateway and, and in a stone stairway that's carved to a soft molded smoothness that you can run your hand up. In the extraordinary imaginative capitals of columns with their plant-like, creature-like surreality. Note too how subtly the columns are chamfered and the ribs moulded. In the similar otherworldly naturalism of the pinnacles of the towers, a hundred meters above the ground where you can hardly see them, but made with the same care and precision of sculpture that you might view in a gallery. In the whole structure of aisle and nave, there's a sense that the aim is that you perceive in its beauty, its deeper truth, and you're enlightened. And you can see everybody's heads are looking upwards. Experiencing the building, your vision is involuntarily carried upwards to an extraordinary image of paradise. And you find yourself in a dreamlike forest of magical plants and flowers that as you move seem to change in a kaleidoscope of colour and shape, mysterious but wonderful. Paradise in which you are made aware of light in every dimension and of the way it illuminates form. In and below one of the rose windows, like pools of water in the mountains in the early morning, 
with a mixture of luminous warmth and cool grayness. Heat of a great conflagration. Shadowy, absorbent, glinting, translucent, brilliant. With crisp, crisp clarity and fragile tenderness. It's as if Gaudi finally realized Suzhou's dream. That everything by carrying a fresh view of our reality helps us look afresh in the broader sense and see through the extraordinary creativity in the building, the light and wonder of God's creation. And give us a glimpse into the greater reality of existence. Thank you, that's the end of today's talk. And now I'm gonna do my best to come out of it. Uh, escape. But I'd be very happy to take any questions or comments. Uh, Julian, there are two hands, right? All right. Do, do you want to chat? Kate, would you like to start? Kate, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, I just wondered whether in this time of we not being able to travel, whether you felt um, within Cape Town, anywhere here that gave you uh, an incredible sense you would get, say, in Ravenna, um, both a spiritual space like the cathedral, um, St. George's Cathedral, the Anglican Cathedral here, or the mm. St. George's Cathedral in Woodstock, um, which is probably also not possible to visit, or it could be simply the trees in Newlands Forest and yeah. coming across a cramat. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you for that. I mean, I, uh, 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 you've already mentioned uh, buildings that you could go to, and I, I agree with them. I mean, you, you, you can certainly find a lot of the qualities that I'm talking about in many, many churches in Cape Town and, and probably in mosques. I don't know the mosques so well. Um, but uh, w when you asked the question, I immediately thought of the mountain because I've often felt walking on the mountain that that you 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 have this this sense of being in a space that is beyond imagination and beyond comprehension really and and also the trees i mean the, those old stone pines uh, around newlands and in newlands forest there they do make extraordinary sort of gothic spaces really with their tall tall um uh, uh, columns going up in um, even the gum trees, which you know, when one <laughs> rather looks down on, in some parts of the forest with the sunlight shining on them, they they make these amazing uh, dappled uh, shafts that go up into the sky with the, you know in early morning sunlight. So uh, my immediate response would be that I would find that more in in natural spaces here in Cape Town than I would in built ones. But I'm absolutely sure that there are many. Um, uh, places, uh, church places that you could go to, or religious places, which which have that same numinous sort of quality that I've talked about. Certainly, a lot of the churches are based on the same idea of you know moving you forward and taking your eyes upwards and so on. Yeah. Does that answer your question a little? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Alex, Alex, I can see your hand up. Hey, Julian. Um, Hi, Alex. 
in architectural history were fairly familiar with the origin of the Doric, the Ionic, and the Corinthian columns. Yes. But I wasn't too sure as to the origin of the other capitals that you showed in your pictures. What are the origins of that? Well, the okay. So the the ones in the in the Byzantine buildings were they were mainly classical, in fact. And they, when they were building those, they pinched those capitals and the columns from from existing Roman buildings. A lot of them were pinched like that. So so they really came. A lot of them came from that classical period, like in um, uh, uh, in those two churches in Ravenna, the uh, Santa Polinares, they had those classical columns. The ones in the uh, the Gothic ones, th there are also sort of remnants of classical memory in those in in some of those um, uh, columns. But otherwise, uh, a lot of their forms were derived from nature, from nature, from natural shapes. Um, and you know, uh, in different parts of the world, different parts of Europe, they were developed in 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 different ways. You know, the, the, the um, these skilled craftsmen, uh, master builders, moved from uh, from France to England. So there was terrific cross fertilization between France and England of the the motifs that were developing around those. Um, uh, the, the the elements that that made up the the, the Gothic system. So uh, I would say that, that that they they come from a mixture of old um, memories of uh, classical systems combined with with new people exploring uh, ways of making much taller elements and different kinds of connections and so on. Because a lot of the Gothic works with peer with piers rather than with columns. So they, they, they were these great shafts that went all the way from the floor right up to the ceiling, really. And the, um, uh, then they had these little colonnettes around them, which had a base and, and a shaft and, and a, a capital, um, which, which were sort of wrapped around the piers. But it was a slightly different format from the, from the columns that were used in in the classical system, you know, uh, some so it, it varies a bit. I mean, in in um, Notre Dame, for instance, they still use big round columns, and certainly in Norman England, they use big round columns, as you know, which had sort of they had different kinds of ornaments, sort of chevron ornaments, and those sort of things that went around. So I think they were. Uh, I don't know too much about where the the, the, the actual iconography comes from, but they. You can be sure that they had bits and pieces from or from all sorts of different areas. Yeah, I well, don't know if that's much use to you. Do, have you got Have you got ideas that you can uh, offer well, for the, that? The, as you know, the acanthus leaf is the origin of the development of the Corinthian column. Yes, and similarly, the nautilus shell for the Ionic column. Yeah, I just wondered if there was none some other derivative for the character of the subsequent columns. Okay, no, it could be, uh, but I'm not sure about that. So I, I can't really help you too much there, um, Alex. Yeah, okay. I know a lot. Of, a lot of it is from natural things, so it would be from plant plant-like forms. But all the columns had an emphasis. They 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 applied that principle to the discipline of the design of the column. Yeah, they did. They did use that a lot. Yeah, mm. they'd get fatter towards the bottom. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, Caroline has a hand up. Okay, Carol. Caroline. Um, yeah, thank you. A really interesting talk. I was really interested that you said that when you were taught architecture, that the Gothic style was not taken very seriously and not given yeah. consideration. And I'm quite fascinated by that. I mean, we, we're in London and so we are in Northern Europe and so we see Gothic like around yeah, a lot. And, time. <laughs> yeah, and so I'm interested in two things. One is why you think that was, I mean, I'm aware of the, the root of the term Gothic, but I'm, a, I'm interested in why you think um, it, it was sort of overlooked and also what you think the effects of that might have been. I mean, you're saying that Gaudi... Yeah you know, was able to develop his architecture by using the Gothic, whether you think that somehow, like, not considering it properly in architecture, you know, led to developments being overlooked, or it kind of, like, slowed back the development of architecture. 
Yeah, no, I think that that's a, I think that's a very interesting question. I mean, um, in my training, well, firstly, the, the, you know, the, the a lot of the big protagonists of the of the modern movement, like Le Corbusier, Amit van der Rohe, and Gropius, and these people, were, they, they were all trained in the Beaux Arts system, which was absolutely classical. So that was much more powerful uh, around the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century. Than than the than the Gothic thing. So, um, you know, all the theorists, all the people who were writing books and so on. Basically, they had been trained in uh, in in a Beaux Arts way, uh, out of the classical system, uh, or or its you know um, developments out of that kind of way of thinking. So so uh, so the classical and I mean my my the people who taught me were all trained in the classical system. They could all do all the my my father was an architect. Even when he was ancient, he could still draw all those classical profiles. He knew exactly how they all worked, exactly in the right proportions and so on. Just as Alex was saying, all the story about the Corinthian capitals and the, you know the emphasis and all that sort of thing was absolutely part of their vocabulary. So they were much much more deeply versed in uh, the classical mode. And and the the fact is the classical the classical system is an unbelievable system of architecture. It's like a language of architecture that you can just keep on writing, you know. <laughs> so, so I think that, uh, I mean, it's interesting that, uh, to, to take it into Britain. I know that when there was the competition for the House of Parliament, uh, the man who won it, his, his entry was actually classical. And they made him change it from classical to uh, Gothic because they said that Gothic was much more the British style than the classic, which was papist and, and all that sort of thing, you know, Roman and sort of Mediterranean and so on. So it, it was sort of quite a political kind of thing around that sort of period that, that, that the British definitely uh, espoused the, um, uh, generally speaking, uh, espoused the uh, Gothic as against the classic, certainly from the beginning of the 19th century onwards. Uh, but even so, as you know, despite that, in the 19th century, there was a huge um, battle. There was the battle of the styles between, uh, well, primarily between Gothic and classical, but then also incorporating Chinese and Turkish and all sorts of other architectures, the great battle of the styles. But by the time the, um, uh, the empire really started to move, the classical system was much, much more useful for building buildings of power than the Gothic would have been. So, you know, India was entirely classical under Latchins and, you know, uh, all, all the colonial buildings, the, the, the ones in South Africa. In fact, Baker sent, um, uh, uh, um, uh, not Baker, Rhodes sent Baker to Italy to learn how to do the classical thing because that was the way to to make clear what uh, you know what, what architecture was about. So this is rather a long story in in, in reply to your your question. But the, the other part of the question is, is did it affect the way that people thought about architecture? And I think that it did, definitely. I mean, the whole of mod the early modernism was basically classical in approach rather than Gothic. It concentrated on horizontal, on, uh, uh, you know, it, it used uh, uh, lines of proportion, ideas of proportion, uh, perspective, and all that uh, um, uh, 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 proportional systems and so on, which, which were all derived from the classical system. So that had a huge impact on the architecture of the 20th century, and it was probably only by the 1970s that it began to change. I hope that gives you some sort of feeling of what I was talking about. Yeah, thank you. Sure.